Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear okay? Okay. Thanks for coming out to the uh, Fernwood Community Association's Merrillty debate. I'm Tony Sprack, and I'm president of the Fernwood Community Association. Uh, our event tonight will run uh, until about 8.30. Uh, sorry folks outside there, it'll be standing room only from this point. And it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator this evening. He's a long-standing member of the Fernwood Community Association and he's done this before. We think he does a great job of it. This is Neil Williams. Thank you. Good evening, and, and, and thanks for coming out, uh, and thank you very much to the candidates. Uh, this, this is, the, I believe, the first time we've uh, we've we've done it in this format uh, with uh, with strictly the mayoralty candidates, and, and, and I'm grateful. It, it used to be quite a problem, and I felt it was a little unfair um, to all the councillor candidates to give them 30 seconds or 45 seconds to speak, but. Uh, uh, we we had to do that with uh, when we, we we had a uh, we had 40 or 50 of them. Uh, I, I know it's a it, it's a little cramp. My uh, you know my apologies for the people who have to stand, but uh, uh, it, it, it 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 is what it is, and uh, you've all the seats are out. So uh, so uh, the, the enjoy the format will be the candidates will have in alphabetical order five minutes to speak. Uh, I'll then open it up to questions from the floor, and I'll take a look at how to proceed with that once I see how many questions want to be uh, want to be asked. But and uh, and the, the bell sitting in the uh, right-hand corner is the final arbiter of everything. When that little tinkle goes, silence ensues. <laughs> it is beyond my power. Silence ensues. So um, uh, with uh, with the questions, you can direct them to an individual candidate or to all three candidates, but uh, given that we only have three candidates, I'll, I'll, I'll probably give, as long as time permits, uh, all, all of them a chance to respond in whatever equitable order I can, uh, I can come up with. So um, those are the rules, and uh, I will turn it over in alphabetical order uh, to the first of the candidates, Paul Brown. Well, thank you, Neil, and thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight on a not the prettiest night out there. My name is Paul Brown. I'm running to be the next mayor of the city of Victoria, and I'm running on a slate called Open Victoria. My background, for almost a quarter century, I've been providing financial, procurement, risk, and performance governance to state, provincial, and territorial governments in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not a politician. I guess I'm going to be a politician, right? But I'm not a politician. I do not have any political affiliations. I do not belong to a political party. My decisions will be based upon due diligence and the needs of our city and the issues of our city rather than a political affiliation. Together with my colleagues running on Open Victoria, we want to change the way this city does business. And I want to speak to three areas where we want to change that. The first one is we want to make certain that decisions are no longer made behind closed doors and that the information we need as citizens of the Victoria is disclosed and shared with us so that we can understand the challenges and the opportunities that our city faces. We can't afford to be continued to be blindsided by things like the Johnson Street Bridge as we were following the last election or as we found out a couple of weeks ago around the Crystal Pool and its imminent demise or the number one fire hall not being able to withstand uh, seismic shakes. We need to have this information shared with us. We don't want to be blindsided. Council meetings need to be done in public and not behind closed doors in camera sessions at the, as they so often are. We all need to participate in the city's future. We all need to be able to pull together. We need open government, and that is part of the vision that I want to bring to the city of Calgary. Excuse me, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I was working on a file for Calgary a little while ago. I'm still thinking Calgary. Anyways, so a little bit of humor never hurts, eh? <laughs> Second, we need to focus council's attention 
on the most important issues, those that are of the greatest significance to the city of Victoria. Too often, 80% of council's attention is focused on insignificant issues, things such as miniature goats, or for that matter, provincial, federal, or global issues over which we have little influence or control. My vision is a council that is prepared to deal with the most important issues that we're faced with today. And I will bring those issues forward first and foremost on the agenda because too often the most important issues are left at the end of the agenda of council. And by that time, people are tired, they're no longer willing to participate, and the discussion is very short. We have to have the most important issues up front. And one of those issues the city needs to deal with is its finances, because the finances in the city are in trouble. The import will tell you our finances are fine, but we all know taxes went up 7% last year, far in excess of inflation. Most of us don't know that the budget for parks and recreation was cut by 20% over the last three years. This year alone, the city budget for grants has been cut by 40%. And these numbers, being come right out of your budget figures, right out of your financial statements. So don't accuse me of pulling numbers out of the air this time. You should know these numbers as well as I do. You're the man responsible for managing the city finances. And let me say, no last minute politically driven economic development strategy is going to pull this city out of its situation. We need to deal with its finances today. I have a sound platform in terms of how to deal with that. I'm not here to cut services. I'm here to protect services. I'm not here to close city facilities. I'm going to keep the crystal pool open. I don't refer to the crystal pool as a non-essential service. That is an essential service from my standpoint. I want to keep it open. I've got an action plan for pulling our finances together. And it's critical that we do with it, deal with this now. Because if we don't, it's going to get much worse. In summary, my vision is a city that has its cake and, eat, and can eat it too. And believe me, we can. We just need to spend the money more wisely. We can no longer afford to spend six to eight million dollars buying a couple of travelers' inns and, and finding that we can only house 36 people in them. That's $200,000 per person. We can do much better than that. Open Victoria wants our city, Victoria, to realize its true potential, and it isn't realizing it right now. We can do a lot better if everyone pulls together, if everyone is part of this, and decisions are no longer made behind closed doors. We can do better. We must do better. Open Victoria will do better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. The next candidate is Steve Falopovic. It's actually uh, Steve Filipovic, but it's a tough one, so I'll, I'll pass on. Uh, hello, my name is Steve Filipovic, and I'm running for Mayor of Victoria to provide the residents of Victoria a genuine opportunity to win real change. I'm a small business owner running Filipovic Residential Services here in Victoria for the past 25 years. I focus on building fences and decks through the summertime and doing renovation work through the wintertime. So I know housing, and I know we're paying far too much for it here in this region. I'm also a community advocate, working with activist groups in Victoria. I have sat on many boards, but my greatest, my greatest contribution has been through the work with the Earthwalk Committee. In partnership with VIDEA, Victoria International Development Education Association, we organize an annual event, Earthwalk, which involves a participatory parade uh, and an environmental fair that showcases roughly 40 different cause-oriented nonprofit groups that are championing various issues, both locally and globally, in our city. And this has given me the understanding of, of all or a lot of issues that we're facing together as a community and helped me win the endorsement of Monday Magazine in 2008. I have run twice in municipal elections, both times coming in third place, only being beaten by the two large money campaigns that dominate our local politics. Our little money campaigns have been slowly eroding their lead that these groups have, with more and more people realizing and getting wise to our situation that, that they're realizing that we need real change. Our democracy is in crisis. Only one in four people vote municipally. And I think that's because of the uneven playing field 
Uh, no truly independent person has ever won. So no matter what happens, we always get the same old, same old. And I'm hoping to be the one to change that. Our democracy is in crisis, and crisis is an opportunity. If you recognize that the vast majority of Victorians are not being served by our present status quo government here in Victoria, then I would encourage you to do a little networking and talk to your friends and neighbors and bring them in on November 19th. Have a breakfast party uh, and talk about voting. Start conversations with your friends and neighbors and bring them in on election day. Voting is the least you can do for your democracy. Campaigning is where it's at. If you feel strongly about a change that you would like to see, campaigning for that change vigorously will increase the likelihood of that change taking place. And this is one of the things we can all do to improve our democracy. <clears throat> Another thing we can do to improve our democracy is to challenge the media. An active and honest media is imperative for democracy to thrive. Balanced reporting showing some of the many facets that every issue has is important to people who are trying to formulate their opinion. We don't have that, and we haven't had that for a long time. We now have corporate controlled media, and they don't print anything that may slow down mindless consumption of goods and services. When George Bush announced after 9-11 that the way to help your country was to go shopping, my heart sunk. We are consumers, not citizens, and that has to change. We have to become citizens again, and we have to challenge the media. We are human beings, and we learn about our world, and we make small changes in that world. And if we don't know the truth, then we can't make those small changes. The changes I would like to see, firstly, are more equity-gaining housing opportunities for working families in Victoria. We should be encouraging people who are in high-rent situations to form groups with other people in similar situations. Putting their resources together, they can easily afford mortgages. And the city can do a lot of things to help remove the burdens or the barriers to home ownership and facilitate with bylaw changes, making it easier for them to renovate their homes to suit their needs. We should also stipulate that new developments, with, or a certain percentage of the new developments, be rent to own, allowing people to get in with, with less of a burden of a down payment. Another change I would like to see is that the city own up to the BC Supreme Court ruling that clearly showed that Victoria doesn't supply reasonable services to those on our streets. Our Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees us all the right to reasonable services. And Judge Madam Ross made it very clear that a service is not reasonable if by using that services you are subject to crime, disease, or overcrowding, or strange rules, like being locked in. We spend an average of $55,000 per homeless person not giving them shelter. That's police costs, cleanup costs, health care costs, as colds become pneumonia. Shelter for most people is valued at less than $10,000 a year, and for someone who needs special assistance, it's $28,000 a year. Both those options save us a bundle of money. Our country is said to spend, <clears throat> our country is said to spend over $9 billion a year dealing with the problems around poverty, when poverty can be addressed for $4 billion a year. So that's something to think about. I stand for common sense and an open democracy and accountable public service. We recognize that we've needed the freedom of information in the 70s, we fought for it in the 80s, we won it in the 90s, and we still don't have it. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for your cooperation. Sorry about the pronunciation. I even asked, and I still got it wrong. I, I can manage this one, though, uh, the, uh, the incumbent, Dean Fortin. We're just going to take a minute for the people outside to sort of filter in and uh, come on in. Thank you very much. On the ground. Great, thank you. Good evening. My name is Dean Fortin. I'm running for re-election as Mayor of Victoria. I'd like to start out by recognizing that we are in the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Heichka, welcome. Uh, welcome everyone to this mural uh, debate. It has been a great honor to serve this community over the past three years, and thanks to the people of Victoria, strong team of city councillors, we've accomplished a lot over the past three years. We're excited about the progress that we've made. 
We build affordable housing and addressing homelessness. We've increased public transit. We continue to work on climate change initiatives, knowing that that is still important. And we work with local businesses to make sure that our downtown is vibrant, active, and safe. We're making City Hall more open and accessible than it's ever been. Over the past three years, we have brought in, we have brought in a civic governance review. We've brought in a civic engagement review. A good example is our official community plan. We've engaged more than 6,000 people over the last 18 months, talking to them about how their city is going to look over the last uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. Everything from meeting in coffee shops and at crystal pools, having mocktails down at the Crystal Gardens, meeting with 600 students here at Vic High. Opportunity to get out and meet and talk to people. We've expanded the Mayor's Open Door from once a month to once every two, uh, twice a month. And then we realize that it's also important to get out and people where they, meet people where they are, whether it be Crystal Pool, down in Cook Street, senior centres. Continuing to make sure that our government is open and responsible as much as we can be according to the law. I am worried about these priority areas. We need to keep going. Now is not the time to say, we've done great work on homelessness, we can ease back. Now is not the time to say, oh, we, it's an economic downturn, we can't afford to do environmental issues. We need to keep these areas going forward. We also need to recognize that we are in challenging times and we must implement our economic development strategy, to generate jobs, to make sure that we can continue to build a city that is fiscally, socially, and environmentally strong. I look forward to doing all of that with you over the next three years as we continue to work forward. I did want to take a moment before we start to get into some of the issues, and there's many issues. You'll have them in our brochures, things that we're proud on. Bringing down social disorder in the streets by 26%. Opening, creating more than 800 units of housing for the hard to house for seniors, um, continuing through over the last three years, working with our partners in the Coalition to End Homelessness and helping to find more than 1,500 spaces housing those less fortunate than us. But I thought I should probably spend a little bit of time to let you know who I am. I do live in Fernwood with my wife and my two children. Uh, I am a kid from Kamloops, worked in sawmills and gas stations and, and uh, served beer. I've been known to have a beer once and twice myself. Came down to UVic, um, went to UBC, that campus was bigger than my whole city, somewhat frightening for a young guy, so uh, UVic was just perfect. Over the years, I've worked with street youth, helped working with a group that's now known as the Youth Empowerment Society, helped that get going, and then spent 17 years as the director at the Burnside Gorge Community Centre, working with homeless families, establishing childcare and daycare, establishing youth programs, and making sure there was good recreation programs for seniors and young people throughout. I've done community service, I've uh, been a board member with the Law Centre here, the BC Benefits Appeal Board, uh, Burnside Community School, understanding that these are all important things for my community and I. And uh, I continue to coach. I always enjoyed coaching, whether it be money, uh, mini rugby, which is kind of fun, um, soccer, and now I continue to coach late, um, night league on Thursday nights and Sunday nights. Um, that's a little bit of who I am, a little bit, because we make thousands of decisions over a term. Not all of them end up on brochures, not end of all of them end up on issue sheets. It's important that you know and support the type of person that you want to be making those decisions, recognizing that sometimes things do come forward that you don't have any control over. Um, I do want to, and I assume I still got a minute left, address some of the issues that uh, have been raised here and I think uh, we'll, we'll put it out. Um, over the past 18 months, we have been out talking to our communities. We have done budget consultations at Crystal Pool, at senior centres, at coffee shops, in malls. We've gone out and been talking about the issues and the challenges that we have forward. It's one of those ones that even, what, a year and a half ago we mentioned that we have an issue around the Crystal Pool. So it's always somewhat surprising when someone said, oh my goodness, you've sprung it on us in the last two weeks. When you know 18 months ago, you can actually go back to the front page of the Times Colonist and say, yes. They were bringing those issues and items up. I will say that I'm looking forward to the opportunity to directly uh, correct the uh, incorrect information about budget cuts. Uh, I will uh, ask people that it's probably important that they read their financial statements a lot clearer. Thank you very much. Looking forward to probably more detail from the questions from the crowd. Thank you. a remarkably cooperative group of candidates. I express my appreciation. 
I, I would just like to get an indication now of how many people think um, they might want to be asking a question. If you could, uh, if you could just put up your hand, it'll have to do with the how how I organize it. Um, oh, that's that that that's a fair number. Okay, yeah, I see. Okay, I, I then and and, and that, that's that's too many for me to keep track of. So so what I'm going to ask you to do, and we'll move the mic around, is uh, is if you can form a line. We've tried to keep the center aisle clear, and uh, we'll work our way down a speaker's list. In, uh, in physical order. So Tony will take the mic uh, and he'll pass it back and forth and anybody who wants to ask a question uh, can, uh, can come down to the center there and, uh, and, uh, and, and line up and, uh, and we'll start. I'll, I'll, you can direct the questions to an individual candidate or to all the candidates as time permits um, I, I, I will allow all the candidates to respond in, in as I said, as, as equitable an order as I can, uh, as I can, uh, as I can figure out. Um, if we if we get short of time, um, the rules of the moderator become, um, you know, well, perhaps a little more arbitrary, but they are final. So, if uh, anybody who wants to uh, anybody who wants to ask a question. Yes, thank you. The, the response, we'll, we'll limit the responses to two minutes apiece. And that's from the candidates. Uh, so far as the questions goes, if you could make sure that you're leading towards a question, you know, rather, rather, rather than a speech. Uh, so that, that and keep it as short as possible and make sure there is a question at the end of it. Okay, so uh, first person, uh, go ahead. Uh, Okay, you got it then. I think her name was Helen Hughes. She used to be on council. Yeah. Uh, something like yeah. that. Uh, she's, she owns stock in what was called Terrace, and then they changed the name. They put pipes under the streets without any of us knowing, um, and they're made of what's called CPB, uh, PVC. 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 Poly Polyvinyl chloride. Yeah. And I asked a scientist at Newvic all that chloride on the pipe around our water which has chlorine in it um the chlorine in the pipe i mean and, and I, I, but my question is actually i mean this was something it could be poisonous it's all in our pipes water pipes now our fresh water um but my question is 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 it possible for us to make that public again why does helen hughes get to own that then they changed i mean she's one of the owners she bought stock in it and they privatized it, and uh, then we changed the name. It was Terrison, and it became something else. Fortress. And my question is, is, can we have that back as public? Is that possible? Or whoever gets voted in as mayor, would you, would you tell Helen Hughes we'll pay her back for her stocks? And, <laughs> and let us own that and maybe make them pipes that are safe for us? Uh, so so the, 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 the question is, is can we undeprivatize um, the gas company? Okay, the water pipes. Um, okay, and your question is directed to who? Well, I guess I'm wondering if any of the mayors that are going to come there or the mayor would know if we can have that back as public and then redo the pipes again and make them safe. Well, I'll. I'll, I'll in my in my arbitrariness, we'll start with uh, with uh, Steve if he wants to answer. Sure. And do you, do you want a mic? Um, yeah, it's disappointing to see how much of our society has been privatized. It's a phenomenal amount. Um, other jurisdictions like England, who got into privatizing before us, have spent a lot of money trying to get things republicized or uh, republicly owned. It's a very expensive process. But the thing is, these private corporations continue to bleed us with of resources as long as they own those assets. So it is, um, it is worth doing, but I don't think we, as a mayor, we have power to do that. It would, it would retake a huge amount of political will. And as mayor, I would help to try and build that um, for all, you know, getting privatizations and getting P3s out of, out of our um, agenda is, uh, 
if they can recognize, if corporations can recognize that owning these utilities is important for their future, then we as people should recognize that owning these utilities is important for our future. Dean, do you want to comment? I agree as the mayor, and, and uh, we have absolutely no power to affect uh, corporate ownership at this time of, of gas companies. I think, though, I do want to address one of the issues that you did point out, and, and that we've always fought, and we must always continually feed, uh, to fight to make sure that our water remains publicly owned and controlled. Um, that's very important to me. I, it's something that we need to ensure that happens. One of the great cool things that, that we got to do at the CRD, and I just want to mention this, is we, we about uh, two years ago, we got to buy the Leech Lake watershed. And, and, I, and I just got a chance to turn to the rest of my directors and said, this is the coolest thing, because we won't need this water for 50 years. That it will guarantee us a water supply for the next 100 or 200 or 300 years. And it was, the, it was one of the unique things you really get to do uh, as a civic government, is create parks, to make parks, preserve parks. It's been an actually uh, fantastic thing that we've been able to do. And no one will ever remember our names, just like I don't know who created Stanley Park, probably some guy named Stanley. Um, but you know what I mean? There's great things that are being done by, by civic politicians all over. And uh, I'm just proud to make sure that uh, our water remains public and it is a resource that we're going to enjoy for generation after generation. And we'll keep fighting for that. Thank you. I, I won't take much time because I think Dean and Steve have, have spoke well on it. Uh, first of all, uh, it is an issue that is beyond the mandate of uh, the governance uh, that the city has. So it, it really is something that um, I wouldn't see as being part of the city's agenda. Uh, the second thing is uh, I'm not a strong believer in privatization of utilities um, or, for that matter, our water system. Um, I guess Langford can go their own route. You know, I see a patchwork of private contractors up there delivering services. That's not what I envision in terms of the city of Victoria. Um, I want to protect uh, the services that we get from our, our public workers. And uh, I have a plan to protect those jobs. Uh, and, and part of that plan involves uh, moving very aggressively towards what I would call shared services or amalgamation of services uh, that the four core municipalities provide. Um, the first one I'd like to move on is uh, garbage collection. I think by amalgamating Saanich, Oak Bay, Esquimo, and Victoria into one garbage collection service, it makes a lot of sense. We have the critical mass to deal with it. I um, also believe it's an opportune time. Uh, a, a good proportion of our sanitation workers are going to be retiring in the near future. And a lot of our equipment needs replacement. It's a great time to go to them and say, let's throw our marbles in together and see if we can do better. Thank you. Well, clearly you're not going to line up. <laughs> so, so stick up some hands and I'll do my best. And uh, OK. Uh, a question for Mayor Horton. Last week's magazine, The Focus, had a very critical essay on the project management of the Johnson Street Bridge. And it raised up a number of questions which challenge what's being said as being on time and on budget. Uh, I guess, have you read the article and do you have any comments on it? Um, no, I, I, I haven't read the article. Um, I will say this, that um, I mean, overall, for those who are following the Johnson Street uh, Bridge project, uh, we are uh, continuing to, to look at ways that we can discover efficiencies, um, save some money. That's part of the task that you do at any time on good project management. There's opportunities. For example, we had an opportunity checked with all of the stakeholders in the, um, in, in the Gorge Waterway. The current span is uh, 36 meters. We were originally proposing 47 meters. We checked with all of the shipbuilding, all of the industry for the next 100 years. We can shorten that span to 41 meters. It still meets the regulations, allows us to open and bring everything through, saves us $3 million. Now, countering that, is we have a $1.5 million move the TELUS duct uh, thing that just came back up. We are going to have a project that isn't anything you do in your home, that money goes up, things go down, you look for savings. We're committed to delivering it on time and on budget. Everything looks the same. The good news is, which strangely focused probably didn't mention, is we just received another $8 million from the federal government 
our borrowing now has gone down from $49 million to $41 million. We're hopeful in the next uh, week or two that we might get another $8 million from the federal government. It is still a shame that our provincial government did, did not kick into this project. We do still enjoy a good relationship with the federal government. And as we move forward, we're going to need to continue to work to make sure that those senior levels of government invest in the infrastructure. That's how we can make it affordable. That's how we can continue to deliver the quality service and the quality of life issues and still be able to afford it. I look forward to uh, some other questions on economic development. Thank you. You know, I don't think we should take anything for granted what's written. Um, so, I mean, we should question what's in focus, but on the other hand, there's just too much coming out. Something's wrong. There's too much in terms of this bridge project, Dean, that has not been transparent and above board. Um, I think it's a travesty that uh, Saanich and View Royal, who both came to the CRD and said, you know, we have to replace the Craigflower Bridge at $10.8 million. And the CRD said, you know, um, you make a good argument. That's a regional artery. We're going to contribute 10 million of 10.8 million towards that bridge. Uh, Dean, I asked um, Barb Desjardins, the mayor of Esquimo, uh, why the CRD was willing to fund to that level of a degree that bridge, and yet they didn't for the Johnson Street Bridge through the gas tax. And she said, you know, Paul, we were all surprised. Victoria never asked. Victoria never asked to fund it to that level. So I think there are a lot of very challenging questions that need to be asked regarding the, and answered regarding the Johnson Street Bridge. And um, I, pers you know, I was asked today, can you reverse it? I don't think you can. I think we've gone too far. But uh, my vision is when I come to office, I'm going to do a very close examination of the costs associated with that bridge and how it arose. I think, though, it's gone too far. I think we need to move forward, but we've got to be very careful. If the costs get out of control, this city is going to be paying an awful price for a long period of time. And as I say, I don't want to say what Focus is writing is 100% is, is accurate. I don't know. I can't vouch for it. But there's just too much there. It really worries me. Thank you. Steve, and if we could make sure the comments are all directed at the audience. Uh, hello, I really applaud the work that Focus Magazine is doing. We need more journalists in Victoria that are willing to go through the lengths that they've gone to get the truth of you know, what's behind the scenes here in Victoria. They were the ones who originally released that um, email so showing that the bridge could be fixed for a very low $8.6 million, which the, the city took upon itself to lose that report somehow. Um, if you read the October Focus magazine, they question why the bridge is erect, the rail bridge is erect. And through freedom of information requests, they've discovered that with the real engineering reports submitted, they had a bid on those real engineering reports, and it's for less than $3,000 we could get that rail span working for bikes, pedestrians, and for trains. So I don't think it's true that the bridge is near the end of its life, and I think there's things we can do as a community to save that bridge. Um, but it is kind of a non-issue now. We, we lost the referendum somehow. 10,600 people voted for a Save the Bridge candidate, and yet somehow 11,000 people voted for a new bridge. So that's rather confusing too. Um, but there's a lot of other costs, um, high infrastructure costs uh, that are out there right now. I looked into the um, Harris Green fix-up, the $510,000 sidewalk we got, and I priced out the concrete, um, used my connections with the construction industry and priced out a lot of the different services that would have been needed to complete that project and I can't for the life of me bring it over three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> right um, I've also heard a lawyer on film saying that the every unit in the Rock Bay um, housing project cost five hundred thousand dollars so that's like buying a small house in Fernwood for everybody in that unit now these are things we can get under control and we have to get under control we cannot continue to pay money like it's growing on trees we do need to provide services for homeless people in the hard to house, but we don't need to do it at that level where we're making billionaires out of millionaires and we're not getting the results that we should be getting if we had a more open and accountable government. More questions? 
What about the amalgamation of the, the 15 victims in the South Park? <laughs> maybe amalgamated to maybe three big areas rather than the 13 that we have now? Okay, Paul? Here, here. Amalgamation. Amalgamation. The question was about amalgamation, support it or not. Um, I'd love to promise you amalgamation today because I believe it makes a lot of sense, but it's a pipe dream. Um, I can't promise you something I can't deliver on, but I am prepared to move on it and take baby steps. As I say, I want to amalgamate garbage services. Now, I'm not going to call it amalgamation because Frank Laird doesn't like that term, <laughs> and some people don't, but you know, we're all facing some very challenging financial times, and the rest of the co four core municipalities, I think, would be very receptive. Um, I have a 13-point action plan that I'm going to move on as soon as I come to office. And people say, 13 points, that's unlucky. No, it's not unlucky. It's hard work that's going to take it. And one of those points um, I will read out to you is I will open immediate discussion with a squamal to determine the possibility of renewing our policing agreement. It's a travesty. We should not be losing them. That's a beginning. And I truly believe that I can bring that agreement together. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to give away things. I'm not going to pay for Esquimalt's policing. But I think I can create a situation where we can keep Esquimalt in. If you read the evaluation of the board of the police. You will see every year there are comments in there with regard to the chair who is keeping things to himself, doing things behind people's backs. All you have to do is go to the Victoria Police Department and read the comments regarding the evaluation of the board every year. I don't think that's a way to run the police. And I believe I can bring Esquimo back in without giving away too much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll differentiate myself from the other candidates here because I do not believe in amalgamation. Uh, we don't have an open and accountable government. Amalgamating it into a central government will make it even harder to get information out of it. Right? And now Dean will say that he's running a very open and accountable government. And to that I would ask, why are 20 council candidates running on platforms of creating a more open and accountable government if we already have one? <laughs> right? Now the police are um, one of the main forces driving behind the amalgamation. Right? They want to have regional policing. And their excuse is that they can't communicate cross borders. Now this is ridiculous. We're living in a communication age. Uh, they should just post a website and have everyone access it like everyone else does. Uh, so these things can be easily overcome. I, I would rather prefer a community policing model. If you look at Esquimalt, they're the ones who have signed into an amalgamation police force, and a lot of people are very unsatisfied with the level of police support they're getting. This is driving them back to hire, at great cost, another police force. Right? So I don't think amalgamation works for us. People are saying it's cost-saving, but guess what? We're taking jobs away from people. We need to get our government functioning. We need to get more involvement in our democracy. And amalgamating will do the opposite of that. So please consider those thoughts. Thank you. And I think as someone said earlier, I mean, you have to be careful that you can't promise that a third party will do something when you can only promise what you can do when, we, when you reach out. So recognizing that there are 13 mayors out there, that they all have their own sort of uh, pieces of information and views and, and why they ran, that it's going to be difficult. I agree that we should start looking at an amalgamation in a larger sense. I think we can look at, um, you know, looking at three first. Can we have a west? Obviously, they fit together a core and what I'm now starting to call North, North Shore. So it's, it's West Shore, North Shore, and, and the core. Um, but you also say, okay, what steps can we take? I mean, in the last three years, we have brought forward to deal with some of these issues. So what have we done? We brought forward and have successfully said to a motion is, you know what? BC Transit as a commission should not sit outside of the CRD. We should have regional planning on transportation, on highways and buses and all of that. We've successfully brought forward and now have the province saying we will look at bringing that planning, that regional planning, into the CRD. I'm happy that we've been able to help move that forward. We've done the same thing with infrastructure priorities. We brought a motion forward to the CRD and said, you know what? We are being played by the senior levels of government, depending on who's running in what, 
to say, we're going to give you this over here um, because our candidate likes it. Um, and what I'm saying is, as a CRD, let us determine the top five priorities and then go out and say to the senior level of government, these are the ones you need to fund. Now pick one, two or three, whichever one you like best, because uh, you have to allow the senior level of government some choice there. But we brought that motion forward to determine those top five priorities so we can move forward as a region and get the money that we need from senior level government. We have hosted the first ever, first ever joint council meeting between the City of Victoria and Saanich. And we talked about what we're doing around climate change, and we talked about emergency management. We're looking forward in the new year to have another one. Let us talk about regional transportation. Because it doesn't make any sense to do an HOV lane that either runs for, that starts at Uptown or, or ends at, at, at Tolmy. Uh, we need to make sure that when we do those lanes, that those are important. So we'll continue to do those work. Thank you. Thanks. I, I was just wondering if I could, if I could ask everyone to uh, either turn off their cell phones or, or put them on silent. And you've got the next one, and you'll have the one after that. Ah, the E N line. I would like to get that working. I have an idea that we could test uh, to see if we develop a ridership. A lot of people vote for um, for train services or LRTs in the hopes that other people will get on them and clear the road so they can drive back and forth to work. <laughs> right. So my buddy Don from West Coast Appliance came up with this great idea. Um, there's service buses or service trucks that ride on the railroad, and um, they lock themselves in with their you know the wheels at the back, and so they're right on the train right on the train tracks, and they can whip along. So if we fit buses with 30 passenger um, buses onto those, that sort of same system, we could get a loop, a continuous loop going in the morning, bringing people in, and then they would declick themselves and drive back on the empty roads, right? Because the roads are only congested coming into town. And at the end of the day, they could switch around and do it the other way. Now this would develop for a small investment proof that there's a ridership that wants to come in with it for a 10 minute train ride and come into town and then go back home at the end of the day. After we establish that there is a large ridership materializing, then we can invest again in the E&N railroad and to get it up to snuff to have trains passing each other, which would be the big problem barring it now it would have to be there and back and there and back. Right? So forming a loop with vehicles would give us a good test to see if there's a ridership that develops and then we could justify the investment, which I think should be in the ENN. The LRT seems to be designed to make Walmart the center of our city and I'm against that. Okay, so that's what I think about the ENN. We should, we should strive to preserve it for sure. Thank you. Uh, the Indian is something that I fought long and hard for. Uh, one of my first things I did when I got elected to mayor was to bring all of the mayors from here to Duncan all together. Fourteen of us went in and talked to the, uh, the province and said, this is something that we need to see and we need to explore it as a commuter rail. Unfortunately, um, it wasn't to be. Uh, I mean, one of the persons, uh, Minister Murray Cole, as he said, there's only going to be one train running and it runs by Uptown. It doesn't run there. Uh, and that's the province coming in with their money. We also had the big challenge, obviously, around the bridge, where people are saying, spend the extra $12 million to put that rail on the bridge. At the same time, Graham Bruce is saying to us, we're going to shut the railroad down in three months. So do we do a fast ferry thing? Do we put a $12 million viewing platform on our bridge? Uh, knowing that it's going to be closed, knowing that it needs uh, a $15 million investment just to keep it running at 25 kilometers an hour that needs $150 million investment to make it run up and down. I believe it's a dayliner is really, really important. I believe that it's important that we, we preserve the corridor so as we move forward in the future. But I will also say this. I recognize that the ENN, as a commuter rail, and commuter only runs during the day morning and only runs it during the night. It's not rapid. It's not every six minutes. Um, as a commuter rail, the estimates is that it will move 5,000 people a day. That's the top end of estimates. Light rail on the Douglas Street corridor, the estimates are 30 to 45,000 people a day. That's moving a lot of people. And I want to say that when you take a look at light rail, it's really important. I mean, when people came forward and said, well, we'll just do the light rail from Langford to Uptown and we'll stop there until Victoria is ready to go. 
Do I really want to create uptown as the middle of our, our region? We need to make sure and we need to understand that congestion is huge in our downtown. And to make sure that our downtown, which creates 45% of all the employment in this whole region, remains active, vitam, and make sure that we can keep moving in and deal with those issues of congestion. We have to do it. We have to do it in an affordable way. We can only do it if we have the federal government and the provincial government in, but it is something that we're going to have to do for our future. Thank you. Well, as I said at the beginning, um, I'm not a politician in constant, <laughs> I want to be a politician, but because I'm not a politician, I'm more inclined to tell you what you need to hear. Um, yeah, I'd like to have the ENN back, uh, but I don't think it's realistic at this time. Uh, I'd like to have an LRT, but I don't think it's realistic at this time. Um, we do need to deal with the transportation issue. There's no doubt about that coming in from the Western Shore. Whose problem is that? Well, it's a, it's a regional issue, but it's a problem that's affecting people from Saanich and the Western communities. And I think we should be at the table and coming up with a regional transportation strategy to, to deal with it. I don't know whether LRT is the right solution, to be quite honest with you. I'm willing to listen. But what I also want to say to the Western communities in Saanich is, you know, we're prepared to come to the table and deal with your regional issue, transportation. It doesn't affect us in Victoria. But if we're coming to the table to deal with your regional issue in terms of transportation, we do expect you to come to the table and speak to our regional issue, and that be regional policing, and the fact that we've been carrying the ball in terms of regional homelessness in the Victoria Centre. It's unfair to expect us to deal with their issues if they're not willing to deal with ours. I would just add this last minute. Um, many of you probably know, but I'll say, who built the Lionsgate Bridge? The Guinness family. The Guinness family built it because they wanted to increase the value of their properties on the West, on the uh, British properties. If we build the LRT, the major benefactors are not going to be those of us in Victoria, and I think we should be focusing on the priorities that we have in the city of Victoria. We need to replace the crystal pool. We need to deal with the infrastructure. Fernwood is probably the worst example of how infrastructure has been let go. Your curbs, your roads, your sidewalks, they need addressing. That's the priority. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everyone coming out and sharing our democracy. I don't think this is much of a forum really to deal with our answers or get to know our candidates, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> I, um, I have a few issues. I think that there's, uh, the streets are owned by the rich and that few small entrepreneurs have any opportunity to start businesses in this city. And I wonder if any of the mayors have any vision to help small entrepreneurs build small businesses and be able to pay their mortgages and their rent. I also, I also have a few other things. I'd like to know what the mayor's candidates here think about the square and what they would like to do there. Um, I also have another, and I don't want to keep standing up, and I probably don't have that opportunity, but I also like everyone here to know that the, these people aren't only applying to be the mayor, they're also applying to be our chairman of police. And I'd like to know, I personally think that that shouldn't be the same position, and that people should know that they're voting for the chairman of the police, of the board of the police, when they vote for their mayor. And I, I personally agree, that, uh, again, think that it should be a split position. And I'd like to know if any of the mayors would like to reduce their responsibilities by creating a commissioner for people in general. There were a few there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is there any one question that is the most critical, the, the police chairman? Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them talk about it anyways. And mostly emotionally involved with the people in the square and how little attention anybody's even brought up to that. And there are people sleeping hard on cold cement floors tonight for all of our democracy. And your, so your question on the square is? I would like to know if any of these mayors would support the people that are actually sleeping on hard, cold cement tonight. Uh, you have a question. And uh, we'll start with Dean. When we ran three years ago, we said homelessness is going to be our number one priority. And, and that's something that we've done a lot of work on, and there's a lot of work left to go. 
We have some fantastic partners within the city, and I want to say that when we start talking about the numbers and the accomplishments that we've made, it's only in recognition that whether it be other levels of government, BC Housing has been amazing and stepped up, so has the CRD. Um, we've got a small little bit of help from the uh, federal government, but most importantly, all of the service providers that are out there helping us do the work. Over the past three years, we've helped create close to 800 units, and it's in here, of what we've been able to help. Units that are need to be supportive units for those that are hard to house. We've created ACT teams that provided support programs. We've created streets to homes programs through our coalition to end homelessness. We've, created, we've helped house more than 1,500 people over the last three years. It is significant difference out there. It's not enough. We need to continue to do the work. We need to finish the job that we started. We put together a 10-year plan that said, here's how we're going to end homelessness. Now let's be, let's, let's be clear, we're not going to end addictions, we're not going to end mental illness, we're not going to end poverty. We do not have the resources for that. But with our partners, we can make sure that everybody who has a home that needs a home can get one. It's a difficult road, we've had great, we've made many miles on that stuff, but as Robert Frost said, we have many more miles to go. That's something we need to maintain in this uh, next three years and keep it going. Let's finish the job, it's really important to me. Hopefully it's important to you too. The question about what are we doing to make sure that people don't aren't sleeping in concrete? Okay, so uh, I thought you were talking about I thought you were talking about the homeless that are sleeping on the streets. You know, I mean, I totally support all of the uh, policies and principles that have been behind all of that Occupy movement. We all, and I'm sure everyone here, has concerns about social inequality. I'm waiting for the bell to ring any second here. Uh, issues around social inequality. We need to make sure that the space is available for every, well, I'll look for a chance to answer that question in more detail. Thank you. You made the decision to turn their water off and their power off. Uh, we'll so make that another question. question. Thank you. You're not going to like what I'm going to say. <laughs> Listen, I was out there during the days of Vietnam protesting, and one of the challenges we had was to keep the public on our side. I think the movement is an honorable one. I really do. And we've got to keep the public on side. We've got to keep this movement going. I don't think it's doing anything right now, and I, I, I appreciate the, the sacrifice these people are making. I mean, it's cold outside. Imagine what they're sleeping through right now. But it's not helping the cause anymore. We've got to find a way of moving the cause forward in some other way, because we're going to lose the public support if we haven't already, and we don't want to. Um, in terms of homelessness, just to respond to that, um, I believe under the last three years administration, you can only claim credit for 36 units. The rest of the units were started well beyond, well before this administration started. So we've created 36 units at a cost of somewhere between six and eight million dollars. That's over 200,000 per unit. It's admirable what we're doing, but we gotta pay attention to what it costs. We can do far better than that, really. And we block entrepreneurs who want to go out and create units themselves, and yes, they're going to make a little bit of money out of it, and we say, oh, they're going to be slum landlords. You want to talk about slum landlords? Go down to the Queen's Hotel that the city bought. That is a slum. Come on, let's be realistic. We've got to pay attention to the bottom line. We've got to make this money work. These people need homes, and to throw money around without paying attention to the bottom line, I'm going to get better value out of the money. Thank you. Okay, for your first question about um, helping support small businesses, I totally believe in small businesses. They make up 80% um, of the businesses of Victoria. They bring in the lion's share of employment opportunities and taxable benefits. As mayor, I would slowly decrease the amount we're spending with large business and, and change that focus to getting more services locally. We need to build our local economy. We're living in very charged global times, so building uh, local resistance or resilience is something that's very imperative to our future. 
The Occupy Victoria movement. I wholeheartedly support those people who are occupying that square and fighting for our rights to stand up to the establishment because the establishment is not serving the people anymore. They've taken Canada way off course and we need to get back on course. That being said, there might be a time when those people don't need to be in that square anymore. My plan as mayor is to um, invest in our community centers and make them the dynamic um, areas for democracy that we should have had from the beginning. Um, right? Well, that means more staffing, more, more um, resources, um, like uh, media centers and things like that. And this is where people who are activists can come in, develop their message and help have assistance to get it out to the community and build political will. Right? Democracy is all about political will. Right now, we need more of it, a lot more of it. And as for being um, on the chair with the police board, that makes me nervous, it does, because the police have been doing a lot of things that I don't feel proud of, and I think that's affecting the morality of a lot of the officers. Right? We need to get them back on track. They need to start treating people with more respect. I've seen them having to do things that I'm sure they're ashamed of. Right? We have them walking along at certain times of the year with dump garbage trucks and they strip all the belongings off of individuals on the street and throw it in the garbage truck and continue on to the next homeless person. I don't think any officer in Victoria signed up for that detail and I think that if we can get poverty off the streets by addressing poverty, we won't have to be sending our police force after them. It's not illegal. Okay, so it's hurting our police force and it's hurting our, our tax base. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, my, my question is more for the mayor. I wanted to know um, if he is aware that there's actually three deaths and counting at 710 Queens. And I understand that, there, that the mayor of Vancouver is shutting down the protest there based on one overdose that took place in, in a large protest. And yet I don't hear anything about the deaths that are taking place at 710 Queens. I think that having a direct hand in in security on that block, that I have a personal knowledge of what's going on down there. I work with the police on a daily basis. And I just want to know, what are you going to do about maybe even just reporting those deaths and then hopefully doing something about it? I'll address it and then, then everybody else will do it. Um, so I'm going to start from saying when people make claims, whether it be that one, other ones, please start to ask for the source of where they're coming from. So let's talk about the travelers. I want to clear some of that up from the start with. The city of Victoria went out and, bought, and for about $6 million bought two travelers in. Uh, 710's Queens, which is 39 units. We also have 70 units in the Gorge Road one. It was important and we worked with the community to understand two things. Uh, with Burnside Gorge community, they really expressed an interest in having more families in their community. And we recognize it's an overload community. We also recognize that one of the big challenges we have around homelessness is that First Nations make up 4% of our general population. They make up 26, 27% of our homeless population. They make up a huge percentage of, uh, of our populations in jail. I think like 40% of all children in care are First Nations. So we had an opportunity to work with our First Nations to say, how can we take the travelers on the gorge and turn that into First Nations family housing? And they have a dream and they have something that they're working forward to. It's taking longer than we anticipated but we think it's really important that we honor our First Nations partners as we move that one forward. So, just so you know, the amount of units we're working with. Secondly, the money. Yes, we spent $6 million. What they're not telling you is we got $2.5 million from the provincial government to help purchase that. We got $1.2 million from the federal government to help purchase those. We got over a million dollars from the CRD to help purchase those. In the end, the City of Victoria is putting in about $1.2 million to get those two units, to get those supportive housing units out there. Then they make the claim that it looks like a slum. So we had an opportunity last Christmas. And what we said is, it's cold and wet weather and let's put 40 mats on the floor at St. John the Divine. And you know what? No one was coming in and using those mats. And we sat in a room and said, let's get out of the box. We've just got the travelers. We were going to close them to do the renovations. And we said, you know what? Let's take the money, that operating dollars that are associated with those mats on the church basement, sleeping with 40 other people all, by your, all together collectively, and open that travelers now. Let's open it now. So people in the cold and wet weather could move into their homes. And we did that. 
That's what we moved forward on. We had to go in, we had to spend some money to make sure life and safety issues were secure. The railings are rotting and all of those sort of issues. We now have a plan with Kool-Aid and we'll be moving forward with the renovations. Part of why it hasn't gone so fast is we want to be able to do it six units at a time. I don't want to empty those 40 people out of there. Six units at a time so that we can do the renovations and not have to displace people. So there's the big plan. So make sure you get all the facts, the numbers, and all of this is on the website. We're hiding it right there in front of everyone on the website, published in the paper. It's all there. So make sure you know that. I am not aware of anybody that has died in 710. Uh, I, I think it would be brought to my attention by staff, brought to my attention by police. I mean, these are things that we brought to attention. I do have a concern with some of the other travelers. Yes, we've had two murders in other travelers. We've had a fire. There's some major serious concerns about private management that's not putting money in. And when someone comes forward to me and says, I want to build substandard housing and make money off the poor, I'm saying make sure the housing is decent and make sure you have the supports in there. Don't ask me, you got the wrong mayor if you want me to approve some housing. Yeah, it's really sad to hear that there's so many deaths related to that house or that um, Queen's apartment. I was talking to someone who was complaining about the bed bug situation there. Um, it's unfortunate what we do. Um, cramming too many people into one small space and uh, and spending our tax dollars like it grow, they grow on trees, right? I mean, Dean may have been able to, to say that a lot of the other money came from other, other sources, but that's still your tax money and it's still being spent on a per unit basis that's astronomical compared to what a regular person would do, right? If you, if you put your tender out and you challenge your, your, the people who are bidding your, your projects to make sure that they're coming in on budget and on time and in a realistic manner, there's no reason why the city should be subsidizing construction companies, right? There's a per foot basis for everything in the construction industry and we should be making sure that we're sticking to those realistic estimates, okay? We are paying way too much for capital projects in, in Victoria and we have to stop that. It's admirable that the city jumped in where the province should have been. But I'll tell you, when you get into something you don't understand, you've got to walk very carefully. We bought two facilities. One facility is operational. It's got 36 units in it. We've spent between 6 and $8 million. And when I say we collectively, that's how much money is being spent. The travelers in on the gorge, the budget was $400,000 to improve it. It is mushroomed to $4 million. They didn't do their estimates properly. That's why it's not open. The city didn't have the money to do it. They didn't budget properly. And yes, we got a lot of funds from other levels of government. But you know what? We're going to have trouble getting money from them in the future if we keep spending it the way we did. Because they're looking at it too and saying, wow, we got lousy value. This is not an administration that seems to pay any attention to the bottom line. We've only got so much money. We are in financial trouble already. We don't need to go further. I'll give you another example. Pandora Green. The budget was $210,000. They ended up spending five hundred, dollars And they say they came within budget because they increased the budget. You know what I would have done? I would have spent twenty dollars or $30,000 reseeding that lawn, putting some string around it, and enforced the no camping. And I would have put the rest of the money into our place to keep it open 24 hours a day. That's where the money would have done well. Instead, we poured half a million dollars into a project that very few people use, very few people care about, and we went way over budget. We've got to pay attention to the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. More questions? Yes. And you'll be after that. In our uh, communications and information age, um, and as someone who likes to engage in these civic matters, I've had on occasion requested freedom of information. But just recently, I've been given a letter saying that I'll be charged for that information. 
and they can't tell me if it's ten dollars or hundred dollars. I'm a little worried when information becomes so difficult to get. So I'd like to ask the candidates with freedom of other information, shouldn't that be free for the public to get information? All <laughs> your Definitely. Um, the emphasis in our city seems to be withholding information, uh, screening it, spinning it. We have an office, I am told, of nine in the communication office. Saanich has zero. You want answers in Saanich? You go to the department head. They'll tell you what the answers are. That's one of the action steps I have. We will put an end to the communications office. We will put the focus in this city on getting information out to the public in as unfiltered fashion as possible, in as user-friendly a fashion as possible. We will change the focus away from withholding information. In fact, I want to model my approach very much on, on uh, Governor Gregoire from Washington State, because she, when she came to office a number of years ago, she took over from a previous Democrat. She's a Democrat, so it wasn't a political per se, but she said, we're going to change the focus. We're not going to be holding information back. We're going to be pushing it out. The default will be give it to the public. And that's the approach I want to take. And we're going to save money. There's a lot of money there. Nine people. Let's put it back into delivering parks and recreation, where the budget was cut 20% over the last three years. I think I mentioned that already. I can tell you about more cuts. You may not be aware the cuts are taking place, but believe me, they have been cutting. I'm sorry, I'm pounding away. My wife gets angry. She said, don't pound. <laughs> I'm emotional. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean it. We need to make changes. Thank you. Yeah, what Paul was saying there is very true. I mean, we live in a freedom, or we live in an information age, but it seems odd that we can't get information out of our city hall. It's a public office. Run for the public good. You're the public. You should be able to find out any question you want and have, have access to that information. If two heads are better than one, then 64,000 heads are better than City Hall. Okay? Now, like I said, we fought for the Freedom of Information Act, but we still don't have it delivered to us, right? There's hurdles, there's PR. An example, in the 70s, the Prime Minister or the Premier of BC had a secretary. Now they have over 200 secretaries in the Premier's office. They're the ones running the province. And the same thing's happening at City Hall. When they want to lead you somewhere where you don't want to go, they PR you into thinking you want to go there. And that's not a good situation for our democracy. It's not a good situation for our future. And it's taking us places where we don't want to go. We need to instill freedom of information. We need to have access to our public office, which is Victoria City Hall. So, with that in mind, vote Steve. <laughs> Thank you. And I think uh, absolutely start from the point of view that if something is FOIable, just release it, put it out. Why did the public go through it? Yes, you have to be somewhat concerned about somebody asking for all questions and all thing and grinding your whole bureaucracy to a halt, asking every single question that comes out. Um, but really, put it out there, put it forward. Um, we're going to do that. It's more than just putting out all the information. How can you make sure that the information is posted, but it's on a searchable web? Because you don't want information buried in the fact that it's in like 4,000 tons of paper that you can't have a web search. So we want to make sure that our database in City Hall is searchable. We want to make sure we have live streaming of council. That'll be the boringest TV show, but hey, for those that are interested, we want to move forward on that. We want posting searchable texts of uh, city council documents. We want to move forward on releasing everything that does not require to be kept confidentiality. We want to enhance our lines, and we've been continuing to work on that. But I want to put this forward, and it's funny. Uh, you know, he says, you know, the Sandwich doesn't have anyone. Nothing gets done unless Frank says it's okay in the Sandwich department. Nobody talks other than Frank. We have many people out there. Communications are important. I think that right now, um, that it is one of the central themes of basically of our society and our generation. People want to be able to participate. People want to participate and, and be part of the events and the processes that shape their lives. And it's important to put that information out. I want to say this, because I said to myself, 
what is that guy talking about, about 20% cuts? I mean, you talk to any community center director, you talk anybody in Parks and Rec, there are no cuts. What is he talking about? So a citizen phoned up and said, what is he talking about? And the only thing that they could find was that under the accounting practices, that the $4 million that used to be in Parks and Recreation that pays for a public library, that the auditor said, move it out of Parks and Rec and put it over in general. So that's the only, only thing. And so it's no cut. The auditor just moved it to a different location. There have been no cuts to Parks and Rec. And I'll go through and give you the numbers. I got it posted anytime you want it. It's not true. Hey, thanks. And your question. Um, I'm uh, retired and uh, a fixed income. And we own a house here. And I'm very concerned about my taxes, my <coughs> property taxes. And uh, here, Speak up. I'm very concerned about my property taxes. I'm a retired and on a fixed income. So um, I'm really concerned about this thing about LRT because I really feel like it's a big boom dog. I think it's going to be really, really expensive. And I think we should put it off until we do have an amalgamated system with a bigger tax base. We're a very small tax base in Victoria. And I don't think the rest of the CRD is going to put in as much as we would like. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure issues. We have the Blue Bridge. We have the, uh, the Crystal Pool. I'm all for that. Um, we may have to do a sewage treatment with extra taxes there. Every time, every couple of years, I see an extra line on my property taxes where something has been, you know, now I pay for this and this added to this and separate, you know, when I pay more. And I'm very concerned about this. So um, my question is, um, or have you really um, gone through the possibility of setting up HOV lanes and seven, like for all the billions to do with an LRT, we could have a really good bus system, run really good buses, a lot more than have everybody, you know, good green buses and, um, and not wreck our downtown. I mean, I, I used to live in Edmonton and Calgary and I moved here because of a beautiful downtown. I, I don't want a heavy industrial kind of, you know, it's just, it's going to wreck our downtown. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not for it. Okay, I, I think we've all got the question, and uh, Speaker Jordan will be Steve, Dean, and Paul. Uh, over the last few years, the city has become really um, good at uh, taxing us, right? In 2001, the annual budget was $105 million. And they ran the city with, with all the garbage pickup, disposal, water delivery, same system we have now. But now they're running at a budget of $200 million a year. That's a substantial increase over those 10 years. And they've been neglecting to deal with the biggest issues we all face, which is the cost of housing affordability and the growing crisis of homelessness on our streets. Um, we can save money by addressing those problems instead of dealing with them. Uh, like, um, like I was saying, Canada spends $9 billion a year addressing the problems of poverty. And it would only cost $4 billion in all of Canada to eradicate poverty for that year. So we have to challenge the establishment. They like the status quo. Um, I'm not sure why they're continuing to pressure us into buying more police as policing or crime has been dropping off. Uh, so we can challenge these assumptions that our society has been making and we can get our property taxes lowered again. 7% uh, jump in property taxes is a bit ridiculous, especially since that if we promised to borrow the money, there would be no significant jump in taxes. We, we heard that story. Um, so things are getting a bit ridiculous. User fees for everything. A lot of people have been complaining about parking downtown, uh, how much it costs and how quickly they're ticketed if they're three minutes late. Um, and, and businesses are closing. You'll notice that there's a lot of vacant storefronts downtown. People are moving out to the malls because they don't have a problem with homelessness there. Okay, now it would be the right thing to do and a cost saving measure to address that. The infrastructure projects that they're coming down the pipeline, I question all of them. They said that the crystal pool was designed to last 20 years. I think that's ridiculous. Um, they've also set it up by, if you notice the last line in their story said, it's the most greenhouse gas emitting building we have. So they're setting up 
you guys to accept the fact that we're losing the crystal pool for no good reason. Cement and steel structures can last a very long time. Thank you. Wow, within that, there's so many questions. Uh, let me just uh, try and hit you some quick snappers here. First of all, I think it's important that if we can, we move to uh, more of a service charge, that for you as an individual household, uh, that if you can say, I control how much water I use, that I can individually change how much my tax system, rather. So if we can move more stuff to utility-based as opposed to just property tax, that at least gives you a chance much like we're doing on garbage. Now we think it's really important that we pull the organics out of the garbage, but we're saying you can change how much you pay by saying, are you gonna do a large tote or a small tote? And we're gonna come out and consult with you and say, do you want it every two weeks? Do you want it once a week? Do you want any alternate weeks? So we're coming out, we're engaging citizens and saying, you have it and we're gonna provide that opportunity for you to say, yes, much like your house, things happen, pipes get old, things, roofs need to be placed, there is, like a city, you need to continually invest in your infrastructure and put in. Victoria's a little bit of an older city. We got old pipes, you know. Uh, we finally got rid of the wood ones, still got a few brick ones. We're relining sewers. We have a lot to do. In 20 years, we're gonna be in great shape, and the challenges will be for Langford and Saanich and all the rest if they don't build up the infrastructure to deserve to make sure they're dealing with it. I think it's important, though, that we do recognize that we are seeing increasing taxes. We are seeing increase in challenges. Um, you know, Steve put out and said, well, take a look at 2001. I was trying to think, what was significant about 2001? And I went, oh, yes, Gordon Campbell got elected. <laughs> you want to know how homeless? I mean, they closed down all of the mentally ill, and they left for municipalities to deal with that. I am proud of the work that we've done to deal with homelessness. We have much more to go. I want the opportunity to continue to do that. We have done, and we have done, and it's, it's, we've been working for 18 months to develop an economic development strategy, recognizing that if we can grow the economic pie, that's the way that we can address the issues of around. And I'm very curious to see someone else's plan. I know that my plan wasn't built by me. What we did is we took 30 of the best and the brightest in the city, the head of tourism, the head of high tech companies, the head of uh, uh, the local business associations, the head of the green business associations, the, the home-based value system, and said, let's build a plan. So I say, attack them at their peril. It isn't me that built this plan. It's the best in the city of Victoria. I'll be the first to agree that taxes have risen far faster than they should. In fact, I was really disillusioned when the mayor this year went out to community associations, and I was at many of them, and he promised taxes would rise 3.96%. And then we got hit with 7% a month and a half later. What happened between 3.96 and 7%? Well, he'll rationalize it to you, but it was wrong. It was wrong to promise one thing, say another. We got priorities. Um, what are they? Well, you know, the city has promised, mayor has promised to come out with a list of infrastructure priorities, so we're not going to be surprised like we were with Blue Bridge. But that promise was over a year and a half old, and we still don't have them. LRT is his number one priority. He stated that a number of times. It's not my number one priority. Uh, that's, you know, somebody else's. Um, when we look at our taxes, we're paying 20 to 35 percent more than they are in Saanich, 30 to 35 percent more than they are in Oak Bay. And these are based upon numbers that come right out of government figures. I'm not misleading you on this. I'm telling you the truth. I can't promise to keep taxes down. I'd love to promise to keep them to the rate of inflation or less, but I don't know what I'm dealing with. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have an independent financial review of the city's financial affairs. I need to know what we're faced with. I know Dean Fortin is moving towards user pay, but for those of you that are seniors that defer your taxes, the more we use to user pay, the less you're able to defer. I like user pay, but it may not be the right way to go for some people. Economic development strategy. I read the economic development strategy. It's geared towards the region, the greater Victoria region. Where were the other municipalities? Why are we developing an economic development strategy that's going to benefit them as much as it's going to benefit us? That economic development strategy needs to be written. It needs to focus on Victoria. It shouldn't be focusing on greater Victoria. Thank you.
We're, pro we're probably coming towards the end of the question period, but uh, 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 next question. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Robin Houston, as you know, I'm running for council. I wanted to raise uh, the issue of 710 again. Um, the cost of the two properties that the city of Hawaii has been clearly uh, identified here tonight. Um, as I think you know, I've spoken to the city manager, I've spoken to Councillor uh, Charlie and Thorpe and Joe, and I've spoken to you briefly myself regarding 710 and trying to get an understanding of, of what is going to go on at 710. I wrote a letter, letter, as you know, on behalf of the businesses that surround 710, asking for a meeting with you to discuss 710 and the use of 710. You wrote back thanking us for assisting you in the duplication of the 700 block of Queens. And I know from comments I've had from those business leaders, they're very frustrated that they haven't been able to talk to you. And we're wondering why you were unwilling to talk to us. Um, I've also put a proposal to the city manager and Charlene, Court and Joe for all of those properties on that block and going forward with a comprehensive development of those properties, much like those uh, in Woodward's in Vancouver, a mixture of market and social housing, and commercial and retail. And I'm just wondering why it is you won't speak to us about that proposal. Got that? It's a bit of an unfair question in the sense that the other people can't really answer it. Perhaps I'll say this. Um, we are aware that you are trying to buy the building from us. We are aware we are in litigation with, the, with uh, you and a couple of other properties, and it would be inappropriate for me to be comment on, pub, uh, on legal matters in a pu public forum. Uh, and that's probably the best way to put it, Mr. Kimpton, at this time. Over the years since you closed my buildings, I have written to you and Mayor Cole several times asking to discuss with you to, to the, the, the use of those buildings, and in each and every instance, you've never responded to me. Yes, Mr. Kimpton, when lawyers get involved, those are the issues. Yeah. For those who are unaware, Mr. Kimpton is uh, the owner of, he used to own this building above here. Um, you can speak to the energy who, who bought it from him. Mr. Kimpton currently owns the Caldwell Apartments, which is closed on Cook Street, the boarded up buildings there on Yates Street and for other things. So it's inappropriate for me to comment. It's a legal thing. And, and probably the best thing is to understand that one of the things you have to do as mayor is you want to make sure that you protect the public interest. And one of them is, is not to talk about litigation publicly. Um, that's best left to lawyers. I, I'm extremely happy, extremely, you know, and I'll put it this way. Charlene Thornton Joe, who is one of the largest advocates for the downtown and for the homeless and all that work, is the liaison. She's an amazing person, and she's the one doing that work out there. I wouldn't want to cut her at the kneecaps. She is an amazing person. I'm going to support my counselors in the work that they do. Thank you, Mr. Kimpton. Well, guys, if you want to talk, you can. It's, uh, it would be uh, Steve and Paul. Or do you want to pass? I, I, you know, I can't comment on this one directly, but um, there was an article in the Times Colonist a few weeks ago regarding a property um, further up. Uh, old Travers Inn, they wanted to convert it to suites and whatever. Rental housing. Rental housing. Oh, no. I, I just, yeah. you know what? I, I really oh, feel. Gee. I, I really, and, and I'm not, I'm not blessing that. But what I am, I would like to say is that the city is not an expert at this. Okay, um, I don't think it's an area that the city can profess to know a lot about. Uh, the province is far better at it. You see, housing is far better at it, and there may be entrepreneurs out there who are very effective at it. And I don't think we should uh, freeze them out of the market. But on the other hand, I am concerned about standards. Standards need to be met. And if I, one set of standards that galls me is what's going on over the old Travelers Inn uh, on Queen Street, or on Queens, that the city owns. I mean, if you want to talk about old standards, that, that, that turns my gut. That, that's awful that people have to live in that, that sort of conditions. And that's a city facility, city owned facility. Anyways. Okay. Uh, more questions? As I said, we're coming. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, you already had one, so I'm going to go. Who, who had their hands up here? Okay, you, sir, and then you. Make sure you go to the mic because the uh, recording people yeah. in the back won't Sorry, get it. Okay. 
Uh, between 2005 and 2008, uh, the organization I represent, Fremont Neighborhood Resource Group, built 10 units of affordable family housing, which now house nearly 40 people. To give a single example of how big a difference this makes, the most recent rental was to a mother, single mother, three boys under the age of eight. They were in a one bedroom, paying $840. They're now paying $895 in a three bedroom. So we're making a big difference right here in the neighborhood. We haven't done any affordable housing as a neighborhood group since 2008. That's not for want of trying. We've, we've actually brought two proposals to City Hall. One was rejected by staff and the other by council in a closed meeting at the pre-feasibility stage. So the question I put to all candidates is, how will you harness the energy and activism of neighborhood groups to work on citywide issues? And when the mayor answers the question, I'd like to know how many units of affordable housing have been built in the last three years by neighborhood groups? Paul Stephen Dean. I see the role of government and more specifically the city of encouraging affordable housing, not going out and creating it themselves because we're not the experts, but we need to stimulate it in the community through grant programs. And I believe there's one in uh, Fernwood where $50,000 was given. Um, and it actually stimulated affordable housing in this building and then translated it over into the Yukon building. Um, I mean, that's what government should be doing. It should be stimulating it, not doing it themselves. And as much as possible, getting out of the way, not creating blockages or, or, or roadblocks. Now, I'm not saying we want, we want to relax our standards, but we want to make it easy. We want to make it affordable. And I, I always think of a place uh, in Toronto called Kensington Village. Uh, what a, you know, a lot of character. You know, I don't think the city of Victoria would allow that type of housing. <laughs> it would be considered slum housing, but that is great. That's community. And this is community here. This is the sort of stuff we want to stimulate. Okay. Community. Community is not luxury condos downtown, which the city seems to encourage and the, the, they're empty half the time. Community is where you have all sectors of the community, the wealthy, the middle class, those struggling to get by and those that aren't able to get by. That's community. And that's Kensington. And I think uh, Fernwood comes the closest to that. And you know what, I would love to see that sense of community created north of downtown along between Douglas or along Douglas and Government Street, you know, where these hotels are. There is an opportunity to create a community there if we try, but we can't get in the way. We've got to stimulate, we've got to work for it. I want to commend you and your group for creating 40 units. I'm sure you did it at millions of dollars less than what the city would have paid for that same project. Um, we need to support our communities and support community activism. Uh, Roots to Roofs is a really good group. Um, we got lots of different um, housing cooperatives that we could be funding again. But my idea um, is to try and, and harness the energy that's already here in Victoria. We've got a lot of people living in very high rent locations. And now if we could create, um, a, stimulate a program for them to get together, 63% of Victorians rent. So they're the majority of Victoria. So it's not a stretch of imagination to have a city hall that serves the majority of Victoria and helps them facilitate small cooperatives and then relaxes bylaws changes some rules. That's what you do at City Hall. You change bylaws and, and create uh, rules that people will live by. Um, enabling them to transform their newly bought house to serve their needs. You know, four or five people living in a house together. Um, they're already doing that by renting, um, but we need to change bylaws to make it legal for them to do that. Um, the other thing we can do... Oh, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, we definitely need to be supporting of, um, oh, if once we start getting people out of their high rent apartments and into housing that's their own, we'll be taking a lot of pressure off the rental market and landlords will start to recognize that by lowering their rents, they'll have more security of having their renters stay there longer. So this will help everyone over the long run by lowering the rents in Victoria. It's a very high and expensive place to live and it shouldn't be that way. Mortgages were designed to consume 32% of your income. Now, a lot of people I've met on the street are paying far more than that for rent. And this is keeping them in a rental trap and it's, it's hampering their ability to develop a positive future. So we should be doing everything we can to help our working uh, people in Victoria into ownership relations with their housing. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to uh, directly uh, talk about specific proposals. One, I don't know what was taken to staff, and, and the other one, um, I think I know which one you're talking about, but we'll clarify it. Um, been really proud of the work that we've done. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be a councillor. As part of a councillor, I was on the CRD Housing Trust. Um, small part to play, but very happy to support uh, the neighbourhood as they put in the units above here, bringing money from our uh, City of Victoria Housing Trust Fund, bringing money from the CRD Housing Trust Fund. Supportive on the Yukon, I remember the Yukon public hearing process. That was one that council had to stand up and say, you know what, I know you might not like the sound of children running up and down the street, but it's something that we in the city believe in and continue to support. Over the last three years, we've continued to support and work with, you work with your partners. We don't do the housing. We do it with BC Housing. The big plan, we work with BC Housing, we work with service providers, we work with Macola, we work with Kool-Aid. It depends what's going on. We work with um, Pacifica to put in some housing. The Greater Victoria Rental Society has put housing in. We've done a lot of housing. It's been exciting. Family housing, below market rental family housing over in Vic West. Whole building abandoned by a developer. Um, help the Pacific pick it up. We've got that housing going in there. And we've also, and people forget about this because we did this three years ago, but we legalized secondary suites. Oh my gosh, what a revolutionary concept. Um, we provided an incentive because that was going down that we said we're going to do a $5,000 incentive to pe help people create secondary suites because the economy was going down. We wanted to keep people working. It was a way for, for seniors to stay in their homes. It was a way, for a way for young people to buy in and have a renter help. Um, and you know, secondary suites are great for single parents uh, that you can have access to backyard and green space for kids. And it's a way to densify your neighborhoods. I argue redensify because we used to have a lot of people living in homes uh, without actually eating green space. We want to continue the work, not only for the subsidized housing that we need for the hard to house, but we want to bring in what's known as a STIR program, short-term incentive for rentals. What can we do to make sure that everybody can afford to live in this town? How can we create more rentals? You know, let's waive parking fees. Every underground parking spot is between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. Imagine, I mean, that's the cost of adding a parking spot to everything. So whether it's short-term incentive for rentals, whether it's requiring condos that are built that they cannot ban renters, we can't force them to rent but we can make sure that they put in rules that they, they have to, they cannot forbid people from renting. There's many things we can do. We'll continue to make our city livable because that's important. Okay, now, I know we're probably not gonna get to all the questions, but uh, we are running out uh, on our, uh, on our, uh, my well, our self-imposed time limit. This will be the last question. I'll then allow the candidates, if they wish, to make a, a, a three-minute uh, three summary in, uh, in anti-alphabetical order this time, just to keep it fair. So. I'm swimming around to what this lady was saying about the e &M. I'm going off in the direction of transportation. It seems to me everybody in authority is skirting around the whole issue of how to save the rail. You may be aware that our agreement to go into the Confederation in 1800 was that these would be gifted rail. And that was the uh, that on the rail belongs to each and every one of us. It's throwing, it's throwing it away, and I think that is the direction that a lot of these people in charge want to go. They say 15 million to upgrade it. We need a hundred billion to upgrade that into fast, efficient rail, bringing commuters down by day. Look at the people employed in the military. Look at the numbers in the dockyard. They come down from Long Island. And, and your question is? I'd like to address to Dean Gordon, Dean Gordon, what is the low factor on that new bridge? Or have you come that far with it? Would it really support rail? 
What we've done is we've not included rail on the new Johnson Street Bridge. We preserve the rail corridor. If at time in the future that they do find the $100 million that that commuter rail gets to run, then we have that corridor preserved and we can add on a rail line and bring it into our downtown. But at this time, knowing that there is the future of the NN is very, very shaky. There is no investment from senior level government that uh, we felt that spending $12 million to put a rail line on there, knowing that it probably wasn't going to run, would not be uh, uh, a wise investment at this time. It's something you believe in, but it was eighth. Cost was a big issue, many, you know, heritage, bike lanes, all those other transportation issues we put on, big one, but we heard that that was the one that although there was support for, there wasn't the strongest support for, and we recognize that. Let's preserve it, make sure it can run in the future, but again, it's going to have to be a regional investment, not just us. So thank you. I don't know how the rest want to respond to that. Yeah, the estimate is about 5,000 people a day, and they expect about 3,500 would get off of the, the dockyards. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have much to add. I mean, um, I certainly would favor the ENN over an LRT down Douglas Street. But at this stage, um, I haven't seen a sound business case. Um, I'd like to see the ENN continue to run. I don't see it as being a major factor in terms of alleviating the congestion coming in from the western shore. It certainly would help, and I think there are some innovative solutions that, that can be brought to the table. But um, uh, certainly the money has got to come from other parties. Uh, Victoria cannot fund this one alone. It just can't. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, North America has had a long history of destroying public infrastructure with regards to buses and railway services. Um, General Motors set up dummy corporations and went around underbidding public um, services and then running them into the ground. So we have an establishment base here in North America that is against public assets in that manner. So I think that there is a lot of hope for, for fixing the ENN, but again, it would have to come from lots of political will. I think a test with those buses to see if we can develop a ridership is a really good step in that direction, proving that if people want to ride on the rails, then it would be worth the investment. Um, so that's what I'd like to see happen. Okay, gentlemen, you've each got three minutes, starting with Dean. Uh, then uh, and uh, then Steve and then Paul, give it your best shot. Then we'll call it a night. I have to ask this: Could you change the law tomorrow so that David Johnson could get out of jail? You, you changed the law. The judge made a, 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 a law. On what the judge said: People are allowed to sleep. You changed that law. You're not a judge, and now he's been given 50 days, and he doesn't eat. He's going to be dead and it's going to be world news and you will be responsible for that. It will be world news, I know that. Because you have had him thrown in jail and he doesn't eat and the other day the judge gave him another 50 days and he does not eat when he's in jail. Thank and that's you that created that bylaw. Thank you. It's none of your business. He was camping with all the rest of the occupiers and you had him thrown in jail. Why didn't you just throw them all in jail at least? Thank you, Georgina. If you want to talk about that after, I'll be... No, I don't want to talk to you about anything. Thank you. I can't. I don't understand. I think you should change... The Someone get that lady a chair. Um, I want to start by saying thank you very much uh, for coming here tonight, spending your evening getting involved in the democratic process. Uh, it, it's really important, and, and we welcome that, and I encourage you, get you, your neighbours, get out to vote. Thank you for being part of this. There's lots of stuff that came out. Part of what I really enjoy about these evenings is you get a chance to understand what's important, important to your citizens. And you get a chance to find out, and we do now at election time, but obviously it's important that we continue to get out through and listen every day to what people have. And it's kind of fun. One of the things that happens um, is I take my uh, girls, uh, we go swimming about 3.30. Uh, they take swimming lessons at 4. The mayor goes, sits in the hot tub at the Crystal Pool. I volunteered. Um, and it's funny that with Crystal Pool now at 4 o'clock is the mayor's open hot tub, uh, and we get a chance to talk about many things. You know, well, let's talk a little about some of the claims here. Western communities, ah, you know, it's their problem with congestion. 
You know, I remember talking to Minister Lund, and he said, well, why don't we just move all the head offices out of the downtown out to Langford, and then we don't have to put the light rail in. I'm going, that doesn't work for me, Minister. Um, let's recognize that we need to protect, protect downtown. Let's recognize that we do uh, need to look at uh, LRT, but I support what everybody else has been saying, whether it's myself or John Luton or even the, the Chamber. We want an independent business case to make sure the numbers are right. But we also need to understand that we're going to spend $250 million doing business as usual, doing buses. And you can do more buses, but that doesn't pull them out of traffic. It's the congestion. It doesn't make them run faster. So you either need to look at a dedicated bus lane or an LRT. And we went on to talk to the people. So if we can get business as usual, paying for buses that we would do over the next 20 years for $250 million, then why wouldn't we? if it's a sound business case, invest that $250 million and get light rail. With all that that brings with that, a great accomplishment, reducing the greenhouse gases, we know it's cheaper to operate. Those are things we need to take a look at. Policing. The problem with policing, and I'll say this, there's no, we have to police the core. We are the core. Um, and same with taxes. There are costs that we uh, take on as the core city uh, that we have to pay for. Every protest seems to start at Centennial Square and at, down in the legislature. Current one didn't stay where it is. Um, you know, but we take on all those, those core expenses. And so, yes, we need to look more. How can we start regionalizing our policing? And the challenge has been put out there to the Shirley Bond to say, why don't we regionalize all of the specialized services? Everybody can keep their patrols. They can have their little patches, their badges. Everybody feel like they're in control. But let's look for those efficiencies because criminals don't know. Um, criminals don't know borders. It's stuff that we need to work on. But I'm very clear. We've given our best proposal to Esquimalt. We will release it as soon as we can. And you will see that we've done everything that we can to keep community-based policing. But I'm not going to subsidize Esquimalt. Uh, and that's going to be important. I will stand up for Victorians. You know, and people have said, you know, what about the, the park space on, on the boulevard? We went out to public tender. We asked for the businesses and the private businesses to give us their best cost, and they came in higher. And our local guys, our union guys, our guys in the, pro in, in the city of Victoria said, let us shot. And they did it. They did it cheaper, and they did it on time. And I'm proud of the fact that our people, that the men and women that work for the city of Victoria can deliver that way. And I'm proud of the fact that we're investing in boulevards and parks. You know, when we do Fisherman's Wharf, when we do Cridge Park, when we do the, the entrance way on Pandora, we do the entrance way on Craigflower, don't even been over there. We had bike lanes, we had parks. This is some of the cool stuff that cities should do. It speaks to the quality of life. How do we enhance our communities and our neighborhoods? It's part of what we need to do. You need to do it in a measured way. You need to make sure that you can afford to do it. Those are the conversations that we will continue to have over the next three years. What are the projects that we have to do? What are the projects do we need help on? And what are the projects we're not going to do? But we're going to do it together. And I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's great to see so many smiling faces. I look forward to the day when we can um, I look forward to the day when we can be having meetings like this in the Memorial Arena, right? Thousands of people paying attention. My name's Steve Filipovic, and I'm running uh, to be your, a real alternative for change. I have a dream team, Ben Isaac, Rose Henry, Lisa Helps, Sheila Goodgen, John Turner, Linda McGrew, Philippe Lucas, and Jeff Young. You'll notice there's only two incumbents on that list, so talk about it amongst yourselves. And um, I think you should be supporting a lot of these candidates. They're really good people, and they will form a good, strong, independent city hall where we can get things done. Common sense has been missing at city hall for too long. I will work to reinstall it as the, as the main mechanism for problem solving. I will create several access points for relevant information and stimulate debate about the directions we should pursue. I will fund the community centres to a level enabling them to facilitate genuine community building and initiatives. I will create dignity villages for those who have who've been left out in the cold for too long. I will shift the spending of our $200 million budget towards those changes in our community that we've been in need of for quite some time. And I will make sure all those shifts are done in an open and accountable manner, in the light of day, and with plenty of opportunity for all people to chime in.
I will place more demands on those in leadership roles in the city, and I will supply more support to the workers who provide the results. My name is Steve Filipovic, and I'm looking for your support on November 19th. We do have a crisis in our democracy. There's 48,000 people that don't play this game. And it's a silly game because we all lose because of their inactivity. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm asking you to reach out into your community, find people that don't vote, and encourage them to vote. Uh, check out my website. There's a lot of things there that could provide us hope for the future. Thank you very much. My name is Steve Filipovic. Well, thank you for coming out tonight, and, and thanks for all the questions. They were good questions. I'm going to sum up and say again, I'm not a politician. I'll tell you what you need to hear, as opposed to what you want to hear. My wife is not happy, I'll tell you. She would prefer that I not be doing this, but bless her heart, she supports me. We're not isolated from the rest of the world. We're dealing with some very difficult financial situations. We've got to get our own financial act together. You know, tax increases of 7%, we can't sustain that. We can't be cutting the way we have been. And believe me, you know, if you want to go to the financial statements, uh, the audited financial statements for the last number of years, KPMG did them, there's a 20% cut there, whether you like it or not. You can go to the budget documents this year and see a 40% cut in uh, grants to the city. Now, some organizations did get, didn't get hit, but some really got hit. We can't remain isolated. We talk about amalgamation. We can't expect the rest of the municipalities to come together with us until we get our financial act in order. They keep looking at our figures and saying, we can't afford to join with you right now. We can spend our money more wisely. We can fix it. But if we delay another three years, we're going to be in real tough shape, believe me. Being promised 3.96% this year and getting delivered 7%, I can't imagine what they're going to give you next year. I love the city. It's a gem. We have so much to work with. Let's not squander it. Because it is being squandered right now in so many ways. Oh, we're trying to do good things, but we're not paying attention to the bottom line. In summary, we can have our cake and eat it too if we learn how to spend our money wisely. But we have too many on council that are not paying attention to the bottom line, or they're not prepared to focus on the issues that really count. Miniature goats, give me a break. At the top of the agenda, and at the end of the agenda, we leave the crystal pool and fire hall discussion, when most people have left or fallen asleep. It's wrong. We can't be afraid to face these tough issues. In summary, we from Oak and Victoria will work. I want to correct the financial situation of this city. Linda McGrew, she wants to deal with the environmental issues. We've got a lot of infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And bless Linda, she's going to help us do it correct. Suki Lali, he wants to bring back downtown to where it should be. A regional center, a, fer a preferred place to live, play, shop, and work. And Aaron Hall, he wants to bring the sense of community back into our neighborhoods. It's quickly eroding. I am asking for your vote on election day for both me and the other candidates that represent Open Victoria. Let's open up Victoria again. Thank you. Thank you all. Before we close, uh, there's a, a couple of words from our sponsor. <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, uh, because you all love this stuff so much, I've been asked to make a couple of announcements about upcoming events. So um, there, there is one uh, James, Sir James Douglas School on Sunday, November 13th, and that's all candidates. That's from 7 to 9 p.m. And uh, the other one is an all-candidates meeting at First Metropolitan Church, 932 Balmoral, Quadra and Balmoral. Uh, the moderator, this guy's known Neil Williams, but it's Stephen Andrew from CTV. <laughs> um, 
Uh, the focus on that one is on housing, harm reduction, and food security, and it's organized by a variety of groups, including downtown service providers, Faith in Action, and the Coalition and Homelessness. And I just want to thank, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> November the 9th, 7 to 9 p.m. I want to thank Neil, Neil Williams for the great job moderating this. I want to thank Paul Van Guzen on the bell. <laughs> and uh, Joanne Murray, Robbie Clark, Pedro Mora, uh, who all contributed to this and to the candidates who I thought did a great job tonight. Thank you all.